Watch this. One and done? Eh, not so fast. A pause is being put on the Johnson & Johnson COVID vaccine, which might take the ease of a one-shot serum away from our rural and homeless communities. You would think passing an education budget might also be a one and done affair. Not so much for this session of the Idaho legislature. Funding for Idaho K through 12 public schools shot down not once, but twice. All because there's a question about curriculum. And we're looking up. No, really, we're looking up at the vast Idaho sky and taking a look at how you're seeing it these days. So the FDA and the CDC are now calling for a pause when it comes to the use of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. The reason? Six women who reportedly got the one-shot vaccine developed blood clots. That's six reports out of nearly 7 million people who have gotten this vaccine in the United States. To put that in some perspective, your odds of getting hit by lightning? One in every 500,000. But it's now enough of a concern that it's prompted the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare to also recommend the Idaho providers not use the Johnson & Johnson vaccine until, well, we can get some more information on this. So what does that mean for clinics that serve certain groups, like the ones who use the vaccine for its convenience of a one and done shot? Groups like the homeless population and those who live in rural communities. Shira Matsuzawa looked into the impact of this temporary pause and what it's having on them. Well, Brian, this comes just one day after we reported that Idaho was actually facing a shortage of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. But despite that shortage, some clinics are already feeling the impact this temporary pause is having and most have discontinued using it. For now, that is. Family Medicine Res Residency of Idaho has been working closely with homeless shelters since the start of the pandemic. They organized mobile clinics and began vaccinating the homeless population with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine once they became eligible under Idaho's vaccine rollout plan. Chief Medical Officer Dr. Penny Beach tells me they use this specific vaccine because it's one, it's only one shot and trying to find some of these folks to come back and get a second shot after three or four weeks would be difficult. She says they've had no serious side effects that they know of, but their mobile clinic isn't the only thing impacted by the temporary pause. Their clinics in Meridian and downtown Boise were both affected by today's announcement. Take a look. We are, had 120 people scheduled today um, to get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And fortunately, we have um, extra stock of both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines. And so we had to get those vaccines over to our two clinics where we were, giving, we were supposed to be giving the Johnson & Johnson vaccine today. Idaho's largest hospital, St. Luke's and St. Alphonsus, have also stopped offering the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. If you have had the vaccine and are now concerned, health experts say it's important to note these are not immediate reactions, but be on the lookout for new symptoms that develop a week or two later, like a headache, numbness or weakness in part of your body, or a new or sudden change in your vision or slurred speech. If you're experiencing those, call your doctor. And to date, St. Al says they've administered about 550 doses and they too have had no complications in their patients who have received it. St. Luke's has given about 800 doses and they were scheduled to give out more this Thursday, but they'll now be giving out the other vaccines. And we also wanted to find out how this temporary pause would impact rural communities giving out the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Both hospitals, St. Luke's and St. Al's, told me they don't believe there will be much of an impact because those communities are either already giving out the two other vaccines or there's enough supply to give out those instead. Meantime, Brian, a federal emergency meeting will be held on this tomorrow. Okay, so it's worth reaching back to this perspective, Shira. Thank you very much for that. But just talking about this, I mean, birth control pills. There's been a lot of chatter about that on social media today and about blood clots that can be caused by them. They've been around for decades. Mm -hmm. Back in 2012, the FDA said that if they followed around 10,000 women, women after a year or during a year after taking uh, birth control pills, about three to nine would develop those blood clots. And while no two blood clots are the same, we know this, there's been a lot of comparison between them. But again, the pointing out the odds of getting a blood clot from birth control pills, one in a thousand. The odds from getting, or I should say, yeah, one in a thousand. And the odds of getting a blood clot from the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, one in a million. So keep that in mind. Another day, another education budget killed over at the Idaho State House. And today it was the budget that pays K through 12 teachers for a second time this year. And in the most unsurprising news of the day, it was killed in the Idaho House for the same reason the higher education budget died last week. There are concerns among lawmakers that Idaho students are being taught social justice curriculum in public schools. 
Are they? And what does that have to do with the funding of Idaho teachers' salaries? Joe Paris spoke with Idaho lawmakers about the issues they see with the budget bill and the reaction from lawmakers who say it's simply getting ridiculous at the State House. The budget for Idaho's K-12 teachers was voted down Tuesday in the Idaho House after concerns were raised during debate about taxpayer dollars going towards social justice content in curriculum and teacher trainings. Some lawmakers argued that intent language needed to be added to the budget bill to make it clear what the mission is inside the classroom. There were some language issues that we wanted to address in there and they weren't in there. Assistant Majority Leader Republican Representative Jason Monks details the idea behind legislative intent language in relation to the K-12 education budget. Sometimes it puts in restrictions on how you can and can't spend the money. Um, so if we allocate or appropriate money to a certain department and we don't want them to spend it on, on a you know, certain you know, program, you could do that through legislative intent. Some Republican lawmakers argue that language should be included in the budget bill to prevent social justice curriculum from being forced on students and teachers. Intent language in here would just be one extra step we could do as legislators to help protect them from teaching stuff that, that is ideology and that is undermining our very foundations of this country. And it is happening. And Schools are not like they used to be. They're seeing ghosts. This is not something that is happening in our public schools. And uh, to hold public school teachers hostage salary for kind of an imagined threat, uh, we felt was very inappropriate. House Minority Leader Alana Rubel, along with the other House Democrats and 22 Republicans, voted in favor of passing the budget, but it failed on a 34 to 34 tie. Democrats have expressed frustration over claims that social justice ideology is being forced on K-12 through students. The reality, they say, it is not. Somehow this turned into this fantastical story about how there was going to be, you know, Marxist indoctrination of our youth. It was so wildly unfounded, um, but I guess through enough repetition on the floor, um, it, it got enough people worked up that they rejected the money. We have seen this cancer culture phenomenon run through our country and there's concerns out there and we want to make sure that those concerns are addressed um, in, in all of education so it's not something that continues to run unchecked. Some lawmakers are raising questions about if adding very specific legislative intent language to the K-12 through teacher pay budget is the appropriate role of the Joint Finance and Appropriation Budget Committee. Monk says legislative intent language for budgets is not out of the ordinary. In an ideal perfect world, we would completely separate those issues. With that said, it's not ideal, it's not perfect. Sometimes you have to have intent within those language. Um, but there is a line as far as are we crossing into policy or, or is this just direction on how to spend the money. Rebel says school curriculum and teacher trainings have plenty of local oversight. We already, we have a lot of local control over this. We have school boards setting curriculum. Um, we have, you know, parental involvement. Um, there just is, I think, no real reason for the state to come in like a ton of bricks with really strict rules on exactly what can and can't be taught in a classroom. Or at least let's wait and see if we have an actual problem before we go down that path. All right, Joe, we've talked about this several times on this show. We have yet to see any evidence of this. But what happens now with this budget and what happens if it fails? It can't fail again, right? That has to be passed. It can fail as many times as lawmakers vote it down, Brian. Uh, the lawmakers are only legally obligated to pass the legislation. There's no time constraints on on how long that could take or how many opportunities they have for this. Representative Monks tells me this afternoon that he knows lawmakers are already working on tailoring a new budget bill for the House to consider um, that could come to the House as early as the end of this week, possibly next week. In the event, Brian, though, that lawmakers vote that one down as well, be back to the drawing board again. Uh, lawmakers, as I just mentioned, Brian, they have unlimited amount of time to do this. They just have to pass something at some point. And that just is adding more time to this legislative session than they probably already figured on. All right, thanks, Joe. And speaking of that more time, if you came back from intermission, hoping the 2021 legislative session was going to wrap up in a short second act, well, hopefully you're able to visit the restroom during that stroll of the theater lobby because there's been a new antagonist introduced that's going to need some character arc development. And so far, this new character has shown itself to be really antagonistic toward education. So we're building toward a climactic comeuppance, and one is coming eventually. Today is the 93rd day of the session. 
and lawmakers were thinking they were going to wrap it all up this Friday on day 96. But it looks like because of today's education budget developments and others, we've likely added at least 10 more days. That's 10. That's more than 100 days, but still a long way to go if we want to beat the overall record. Last year, we saw a shortened session because of the pandemic. It only lasted 75 days. In 2019, lawmakers were in session for 95 business days, but the record for longest ever, you can see that back in uh, 2013, or no, excuse me, 2003. I was looking at those dates together. 118 days, followed by 2009, 117 days. That was the year lawmakers voted to increase the state's cigarette tax by 29 cents. To uh, 2009, that was a close second, as I mentioned. That session included a failed gas tax bill, as well as disagreements over funding, but this time for transportation. In the last 20 years, lawmakers spent an average of 90 days at the State House during before adjourning. That doesn't include any days spent in special sessions, which we know is out there eventually because of the federal money coming in from the last COVID-19 stimulus package. So we're about to push way past the average time lawmakers spend in the State House because there's still dozens of bills and budgets that are left on the agenda, like finalizing the K through 12 budget. Little also has several. He also has several bills on his desk that are ready for his signature, including Senate Bill 1110, which would change the way voter initiatives are put on the ballot. And if he vetoes that, it'll have to be dealt with as well. And he has until Saturday to decide if he's going to. And if he does not sign it at all, well, it automatically becomes law. OK, so some of you may be new to the area. I'm probably asking What's the rush? Aren't they in session all year at the state house? No, they're not. Being part of Idaho's legislature is technically only a part time job. It's usually just a three or four month commitment during the year, which usually starts that first Monday after the new year and then typically goes through mid March or early April. So after they sign a die or adjourn, most would then head home to whatever part of the state they represent and they have regular full time jobs. And those careers run the gamut from lawyers to farmers to teachers to business owners to homemakers to plain old public speakers. A decent representation of representatives and state senators are technically retired, but they've chosen to work for the people during these years. There are some rare occasions like last summer when lawmakers can be called back to Boise for a special session, usually to address something that was left undone during the regular session or for extraordinary circumstances like the coronavirus, time sensitive topics that require some special attention. We're not alone in this either. Like our neighbors to the west, Oregon switches off every year between short 35 day sessions and long sessions that typically run through June or July. Washington, well, their short sessions, they'll last 60 days and their long sessions they can run up to 105 days, which looks like where Idaho is headed this year. Currently, there are only 10 states with full time legislatures, including Alaska, Hawaii and California. Looking for normal in abnormal times. A Treasure Valley School District becomes the first in the area to make mask mandates in school no more. And asking for respect in the process. We're asking for something too. We want you to join our conversation here on the 208. Become part of it through your phone. Text us your comments, questions, and clever criticisms to 208-321-5614. Be sure to include your name and the hashtag the 208. And yeah, we hope to have a clever response in return.
there are more teachers that would really like to go back to teaching their kids in a normal environment. So they can see their We need to give them the opportunity to do that. That is Middleton School District trustee Derek Moore on the phone during last night's board meeting, expressing his desire to lift the mask mandate for students and staff in the district. In a quest to get back to normal, despite health recommendations that say we aren't there yet. Middleton's mask policy has been in place since October, when Cannon County is one of the hottest spots in the state for COVID transmission, and Middleton School District was trying to bring all kids back into the classroom full time. This is how it is written on their website. Middleton School District asked that employees and students wear face coverings during school. From time to time, while COVID-19 transmission is a concern and schools are operating at full capacity, the board may mandate face coverings. During such times, face coverings will be required anytime students are not socially distanced and not at designated periods for recess and or lunch. During this time, also visitors will be limited in the schools. However, the plan was to base their policies and categories on Southwest District Health's seven day rolling average. Back then, when that was written, it was around 40 cases a day in Canyon County. And today, the county sits around 22 a day, with Middleton having an incidence rate of about 1.4 per day per 10,000 people, according to Southwest District Health. So a better situation, sure, but not exactly where we want to be, according to health experts, who continue to encourage the wearing of masks. The five members of the board were also aware of some teachers' concerns of getting COVID, so they wanted to give them the option to require masks in their classrooms. So we would lift the man mask mandate and leave everything else the same and add the wordings. We would request that parents, students and staff respect the concerns of, that others share. If you are asked to wear a mask, please be respectful. OK, so no longer required in school in Middleton, but students and staff could still be asked to wear a mask. Virtually all school districts across the state, nearly 85% have some sort of language in their reopening plans that say if COVID-19 spread is bad enough, they have the authority to implement a mask mandate. And as recently as last month or even last week, some of the area's larger districts decided to keep their mandates in place. And that includes Boise, West Ada, Caldwell, Nampa, CUNA, Valley View, Twin Falls and Buell. But now it doesn't include Middleton. And they could always revisit that should or should increasing numbers push them that direction. Lifting the mask mandate language passed four to one with trustee Jake Dempsey being the lone nay vote. He was also the board member who said he was worried social media would be all aflame with Middleton doesn't require masks. If so, at least this time, it's not for Halloween costumes. Boy, we were really warming up for a while. Had us thinking summer before we even settled into spring. Wido has a way of reminding us not to get our hopes up too soon. While these colder temperatures won't last, some of you went outside and made some memories that certainly will. You shared those moments with us, and now we're going to share them with the rest of you. Whatever you send us, we read. So make sure you text us something. We're running low on some reading material right now. So share your thoughts, your concerns, and your questions. 208-321-5614. Include your name and the hashtag the 208. Send them quickly. We might share yours at the end of the show.
The active weather is focused on the Magic Valley over the next 24 hours, where a wind advisory is in effect until midnight tonight, and a winter weather advisory is in effect for southern Twin Falls County through noon tomorrow for some snow that will be falling across the area. Not for the Treasure Valley, though. This is really focused on south central Idaho and near the Idaho Nevada border, and the snow is focused on the colder hours of the day. So early morning and through the first half of the day, once the temperatures start to warm up, it'll break apart and turn into more scattered rain shower activity. Some of that could graze the Treasure Valley southeast of Boise as a quick little sprinkle tomorrow, but we're not looking for anything in the way of measurable uh, precipitation here in the Treasure Valley, though we really could use it. Through the Central Mountains might get a little bit of snowfall there where they really, really could use it, especially near the Haley area. West Central Mountains dry with some sunshine tomorrow, mostly cloudy skies for the Treasure Valley and temperatures just a few degrees below seasonal averages. Now, once we kick out this upper level disturbance and move it on out by Thursday, that's when we see temperatures rebound closer to seasonal levels. And we're in for a warm up and more sunshine just in time for the weekend. For a fresh forecast any time of the day, find it at KTVB.com. All right, just like Bree's always said this several times, if you don't like the weather here in Idaho, just wait five or ten minutes. We sure get a taste of all four seasons here, especially even during the season of spring. Bree said we only have a few more days of those howling winds and freezing temperatures before things start to warm up this weekend, of course. But even with an unpredictable spring weather we've had lately, it hasn't stopped some of you from getting out and enjoying Idaho's beauty. You've been sharing that with us, which is great. In between the rush of the car to avoid the winds and, well, turning the heat back on in the early morning hours, right? Some of you stopped and captured the majesty of the moment. So here is a look at Idaho from your point of view.
A lot of comments today about the K through 12 budget that was not passed in the Idaho legislature and why that didn't pass like this one from Kathy who said it would be interesting to know if any legislators have been in classrooms around Idaho and have firsthand knowledge of the curriculum. Yeah, that would be nice to know. Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan is apparently putting together a task force to do just that, and we hope to hear more about that. Again, we've asked for evidence and for somebody to speak to us about this, but have yet to succeed in that. Ah. This is not, let's see, what about this one here? No, let's go back. I see, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. What I see in our lawmakers is paranoia. They seem to be afraid of something. I'm not sure what that is, and I'm sure a lot of people out there have an idea of what that might be. This is the last one I'm gonna get to. A lot of comments about the coat, like why I'm wearing jail clothes. Brian, Emmett Kelly called, he wants his jacket back. I looked up Emmett Kelly. He's an American circus clown, which some say might be fitting. We'll see you tomorrow.